Hello everyone, it's Flight Insight Private Pilot Ground School Class 4 Air Traffic Control. This class is all about who it is that we're talking to in flight. You're not always alone up there in the airplane. Sometimes there's voices in your head that are telling you to do things and that's okay. That's part of the system. We have air traffic controllers that we're going to be communicating with at certain t portions of the flight. So this is all about who it is we're communicating with, how and why we're doing it, what it is that we need to say, and what those air traffic controllers are doing on the ground and what services they're providing to help keep us all safe up in the air. To start talking about air traffic control though, let's keep in mind that it's not always a requirement to be talking with any air traffic controller or really with anybody over the radios. It's not even a requirement to have radios on board your aircraft. Remember from the last course with our discussion on airspace that there's certain types of airspace that you have to be in radio contact with air traffic control, but certain other types of airspace, most of the airspace in fact in the country, there's no legal requirement to talk to an air traffic controller. So to illustrate that, if you take a look at the flight plan that's been charted out here, this is basically a flight that goes directly from uh, an airport in Florida, North Palm Beach County Airport all the way to Washington State, to the Canadian border almost, in Orcas Island, you can conduct this entire flight directly between these two points, and legally you'd never have to be in communication with air traffic control or any other aircraft. Now why is that? It's because this flight avoids Class B, C, and D airspace. Those are those airspace around towered airports that require either radio communication or, in addition to radio communication, an actual clearance to enter. It also avoids any restricted areas. Remember that a special use airspace that's restricted by the military is gonna require authorization from a controller in order to enter. So this flight avoids or overflies all of those types of airspace that we need radio contact. Now, is it a good idea to not talk to anybody in flight? And even if you're legally not required to talk to an air traffic controller, can you talk to one anyways. Can you call somebody up? Absolutely. There's there's really very few places, with the exception of remote areas of the country, where you're not able to talk to anybody over the radio, any air traffic controller. But just to illustrate this point that you can conduct a large portion of many, many flights without ever needing to talk to an air traffic controller. So when you are talking to air traffic control, what is it that they're doing for you? Well, for every phase of flight you're on, there's an air traffic controller for that, starting with the very beginning when you start up your aircraft at a towered airport and talking to the tower environment through takeoff, through departure, the en route portion of the flight, down to the approach to the destination airport through the landing and the, uh, the taxi back to the, to the parking area or to the gate. There will always be an air traffic controller that will be working that particular phase of flight. From the very beginning of the flight at a towered airport, you'll be talking to a ground controller. Ground control has its own frequency and they're directing aircraft that are, as the name suggests, on the ground at a towered airport, giving them instructions to taxi to runways, away from runways, uh, along taxiways between points on the airport. It's a way to separate air traffic that are on the ground from air traffic that are taking off and landing. There are separate frequencies to deal with that, and that's just for the sake of congestion so that we don't have all of these different types of aircraft on the same frequency clogging up the, uh, the, the radio waves for important takeoff and landing instructions. So prior to departure or after landing, but in this case prior to departure, you'll be talking to a ground controller that will direct you to a airport for takeoff. After you get to the hold short area of the runway that you've been instructed to taxi to, you'll switch over to a tower controller. This is the control tower. Now often it's either the same person or somebody else inside that tower that was handling the ground. So sometimes the ground and tower controller will be the same person only on two different frequencies. Other times it'll just be his buddy sitting right next to him in the control tower, but they're both able to have a bird's eye view or a tower's eye view of the entire airport environment. So the tower controller will clear you to take off on whatever runway you've been assigned and will give you departure instructions sometimes about turning left, turning right, proceeding to, towards the west or giving you a specified altitude to climb to initially. After you've left the immediate area around the tower-controlled airport, 
you'll be handed off or you'll be told to contact a departure controller. Now, the departures are handled by something called a Terminal Radar Approach Control Facility or a TRACON. TRACONs use radar, as the name suggests, to have a look at departing aircraft around the large airports and manage the flow of that traffic. You know, a lot of congestion of those departing and arriving aircraft in the first, in the first say, 30 to 50 miles of flight around those larger towered airports. As you get up into cruise and the en route portion of your flight, you might be talking to something called an air route traffic control center, or just a center for short. They handle the aircraft on the en route portions of the flights. Now, you're not always going to be talking to a center. Remember that in some cases you won't be talking to any air traffic controller at all, but at least when you're on these longer flights, if you're working with the air traffic control system, this is the facility, this center facility is who's going to be handling you. Now, as you get to your destination airport and you're starting your descent to land, you're going to be worked by another TRACON facility, or approach for short. Remember, TRACON is Terminal Radar Approach Control, so they're working the sort of the larger vicinity around these large towered airports. Just like when you talk to departure, you're, you'll talk to a TRACON facility for the approach phase of your flight. And they're going to organize those inbound aircraft around those larger airports, sort of slot them in so that the tower at the destination airport can more easily manage them. Once you get close to your destination tower at airport, the control tower at that airport will direct you to land on an assigned runway. They'll tell you how to enter the local traffic pattern. They'll tell you where to enter the pattern and which runway to set yourself up for a landing at. Now, after landing, you'll be worked by another ground controller. Again, this is uh, just a function of the tower at the airport. They're not handling the takeoffs and landings, per se, or the aircraft that are in flight. They're handling the aircraft that have already landed or have not yet departed and directing them along taxiways to terminals, parkings, the restaurant, fuel, uh, fixed-based operators, any other business or hangar on the field uh, that those aircraft might be going to. Let's have a look at the control tower. When we think of air traffic control, we, we picture air traffic controllers sitting in the control tower. Not every air traffic controller is going to be based at a control tower like the one in this picture here. It's only at the airports that we're arriving and departing at that you're going to be working with a control tower or controllers that are sitting in an airport control tower. They're using visual observation. This is why they're up in that high tower so that they can see the whole environment of the airport as well as the surrounding airspace. They're using visual observation mostly, sometimes radar contact, but mostly visual obs observation to manage aircraft that are on the uh, takeoffs and landings in the transition area. Control towers are responsible for the most immediate airspace around the airport. So in the case of a Class D airspace, like uh, in the uh, top picture there, that's Easton Airport, a Delta Airport, they're responsible for that four mile area around the airport. But even at a larger airport, like a B or a C airport, you see a Class C airport there at the bottom, Atlantic City, the tower sort of owns or controls the airspace around the immediate area as well. So that inner circle of the Charlie airspace around Atlantic City is typically managed by the control tower. So they're the ones that are sitting up in the uh, in the tower. They've got a view of you. Sometimes they've got radar observation on you as well, but they're the ones that are going to be giving you your takeoff and landing clearances. Remember that towered airports require two-way radio communication, not just to take off and land, but also to transition through that airspace around them. So in that case of the Class D airspace, remember that you need, you need uh, two-way radio communication with the control tower to get in. So any aircraft, and that applies to us VFR aircraft as well as private pilots, we have to be in communication with the control tower prior to entering the area surrounding that airport. And we need specific clearance to take off and land if that's what our intentions are. Now, most air traffic controllers, as we said, are not sitting in that control tower, right? That classic, you know, from movies sort of conception that we have of uh, tower controllers sitting up there in the, in the control tower really only applies to those controllers who are handling the takeoff and landing phase of our flight. Most of the time, we're going to be talking to controllers that are sitting in a room that looks something like this. 
This is Potomac Consolidated TRACON. TRACON, again, is the Terminal Radar Approach Control. This is in Warrington, Virginia, this facility, and they handle a very large geographic area around Washington, D.C. and Baltimore and Maryland, Northern Virginia, that kind of general area. And this is the approach and departure control phases of flight. Now, this is the windowless room, right? There's, there's no control tower. It's on the ground level, and they're just sitting there with uh, terminals in front of them and, and radios and phones. So they're relying on radar solely to have contact with aircraft that they're working. There's no visual observation. That's because the area that they control, you simply don't have the ability to get visual contact on these aircraft. They're working a geographic area that might be 30, 50, 70 miles across, so they need that radar to get control of those aircraft. So that's that R and TRACE on terminal radar approach control. The point of what they're doing is that they're using radar contact to work those aircraft. So the job of an approach and departure controller is to make sure that aircraft that are sort of slotting in or being organized for takeoffs and landings at larger airports are being managed well. They're uh, not coming in right on top of each other. They're at appropriate altitudes and speeds for the next phase of flight. So what we're looking at is a picture of uh, Potomac TRACON, and they cover a fairly wide area. It used to be four uh, control facilities, and they, they merged them into one super, one, one consolidated TRACON that handles an area roughly, for, if you're familiar with this uh, geographic area, it's roughly from the, uh, the mountains in western Virginia all the way across the Chesapeake Bay down to Richmond and then up to the Pennsylvania border. So it's a fairly large geographic area that they're covering. Remember our requirements to contact air traffic control for entering class Bravo or Charlie airspace? In order to get into that airspace, we have to maintain two-way radio communications and in some cases get a clearance in order to enter. So who we're getting that from or who we're establishing that communication from is this approach control facility, this TRACON facility. And it depends geographically on where we are, who we're talking to. But for entry into a class Bravo airspace, we're talking to that approach controller and getting a clearance for entry into a Charlie airspace. We just need to maintain radio communication with that facility. An air route traffic control center will handle the en route phase. This is who most aircraft are gonna be talking to for the majority of their flight, especially aircraft that are flying on longer flights up in the high altitudes at faster speeds like the airliners in particular, they'll be talking to center for most of their flight. This covers the en route portion of their flight. Now, as VFR pilots, we don't usually deal with center controllers. Now, if we're operating in a dense, uh, in a densely populated area with a lot of air traffic congestion, the, the uh, most we'll ever be dealing with is typically towers and tracons or, or approach controllers. But on longer flights, especially over remote areas, if we are working with air traffic control. Remember that flight between Florida and Washington, we don't have to talk to any controller, but if we choose to use those services over remote areas on longer portions of our flight, we'll be talking to center. So center also uses uh, radar to maintain contact with aircraft. Th their geographic area is much larger than a TRACON facility. If you notice for comparison, the Washington Center area, as I mentioned before, there's no real map that shows the TRACON area for Potomac, but this area where Washington covers, covers a much larger geographic area. You know, specifically, it covers big portions of eastern North Carolina, which Potomac doesn't cover, also into its southern New Jersey there. So a much larger area is covered by a center controller, and basically they're just controlling the flow of aircraft to and from uh, those larger airports. So they're dealing primarily with airliners and some other aircraft that are on longer portions of their flight. But at any part of the, uh, of the chart here, anywhere in the continental United States, you have some center controller that's able to work your flight. And these are them listed on the chart right here.